Well, hello and welcome. Today I'm going to discuss uh, 1E Combat a little bit more. I know I've had a couple of videos on 1E Combat and I've discussed some of the uh, details of it. And I thought this time I'd just kind of run, just kind of run through all the basics and kind of how I run it when I'm doing it online. Um, like here on the screen, here you can see I have I'm on the Roll Twenty website. And I've got the turn order up, and I have each of the segments actually set up in the turn order. And then I have uh, various things that might happen within those segments. I will just go ahead and set them up as, um, as, as events, like, you know, the party's actions, the monster's actions, if a spell is going to go off, I'll usually name the spell, stuff like that. And then I will just kind of move it around within the segment, and that just kind of helps keep track of where where just kind of where we're at within the uh combat procedure and yeah it's uh actually pretty simple i will oftentimes have just the uh stats of the creature that's um that, that's acting and i will also have the uh two hit matrix if i'm not using my combat wheel and i do have a video on uh, how to create that combat wheel but um if I don't, if, especially if I'm not using the combat wheel, I just want a real quick, quick reference. I'll have that little stat right there. And all of the monsters use the fighter, which happens to be what I have up here right now. If creature were to use another stat, obviously I would put that up there too. But in this case, I just have the fighter there. And one thing we do when we're doing it, we don't follow it exactly by the rules. We've already kind of modified a few things with, uh, with uh, the 1E group. And that is, and the biggest one probably is with initiative. And we've actually experimented with a few different things with it, with initiative. But what we settled on was uh, more or less what um, the later additions do, where each character gets their own spot in initiative. So instead of the entire party going in one spot, then each of the party members, like the cleric and the magic user and the fighters and the thief and whatnot, they would all get their own. And they would all be put into their own segment. Uh, we've experimented with it with re-rolling every turn, uh, which was an optional thing that we picked up somewhere. Um, that was actually kind of neat how it constantly was changing the combat. However, it made it really kind of slow. Um, so we've kind of moved away from that and just kind of went to the initial un initiative, put it in there, and then kind of move on with uh, combat. The only uh, place where you might have the extra... Um, Rerolls would be like with surprise or something like that. So, um, which is of course usually just at the beginning of combat, although there can be some surprise that comes in later with invisible characters and stuff. But that's uh, that would be a little bit more unusual um, or kind of a case by case type basis. So, uh, we're sticking with the combat equals six seconds. Um, I know there's been some things out there on the internet that uh, people say we well, just maybe go comp compress that whole round down and do all the maths and it's just simpler i guess just to leave it as it is um each uh each segment is six seconds and each round is 10 total segments as you can see here in my turn tra tracker here i do have the 10 segments and then the various events that would exist under those segments yeah we do it if uh, surprise is warranted, um, then we definitely check for surprise. Like in this case here, we've got this party coming down the hallway. We've got these goblins over here. They're apparently a pile of treasure from somewhere. Is it real treasure? It's probably a fake treasure with these few little goblins. Uh, there's some kind of a uh, idol or something with the with it. And of course, the passageway continues on. So either they you know, kind of either go back and go a different direction. Um, or try to work their way through the uh, this this uh, section here. So combat will probably happen. Um, there's they could potentially avoid it. They could distract the goblins. They could turn around and go back. They could, you know, they could find another another way through without combat. But if combat were to, were to break out, and I would be kind of anticipating it here, I would say that the goblins, since they're on guard, are not going to be a su uh, surprise, and unless the party's acting really um, um, confused, they're probably going to be expecting something up there, so they're not going to be totally taken off guard either. 
So a surprise probably would not be warranted in, in this situation. But if it was, we would follow the base, the, the, the standard rule. There's each side were to roll a six sided dice on the one or two. There'd be some surprise segments and applied accordingly. Actions and segments. So if, uh, actions in surprise segments, um, if one side is surprised, the other side is, it, it isn't surprised and they can do a few different things. Obviously there's movement. Um, the surprise. The side who has the um, advantage there and has surprised the other side, they'd be able to do some movement. It'd be limited to the character's movement rate. They're just not going to get, you know, magical movement or anything. Unless they had some boots of speed or something, but that would still be their normal movement rate. Um, they can make a melee attack. They can make a charge. They can make a missile attack if they had their bow out and ready. Uh, they could uh, turn on dead. They could cast a, a one-segment spell or a two-segment spell, you know, as long as it fell within the uh, surprise segments. And, of course, once those surprise segments are done or are all taken care of, and then the PCs, we do declare actions for each round, which uh, is something that we're still struggling with a little bit, remembering to do for each round. But we we are we are doing that, and then uh, we go ahead and roll the uh, six decider to to determine initiative, and we're keep letting whoever's rolling it keeping their own uh, initiative, especially with everybody getting their own initiative uh, number and getting their own segment. We're just you know we're not swapping it back and forth like the rules say so on each so each character's action well, on their own segment or you know and there might be like several of them maybe grouped into a segment which happens quite often and then when that happens we just say everybody's acting at the same time so even you know whoever's saying what they're doing it's acting at the same time as somebody else in their segment so that lets them team up and kind of lets them do some other things that maybe they wouldn't be able to do out with uh with it, uh, everybody going in turn order. Obviously, they can make a melee attack. They can make a missile attack. Uh, if they're making a missile attack and their allies are up ahead of them, you know, already engaged, then they're going to roll randomly to see who is actually being hit. It could be a friend. It could be a foe. Uh, we are not using the uh, same uh, um, rule with the melee weapon in if you're surrounded or if you have you know foes and allies and we're not uh, doing any um of that we're saying you can actually you know you're tar kind of targeting who it is that, that that you're going after and because of the rules as they are written in, in 1e actually there is some a possibility you could actually attack you know you you, you don't really get to call your your um enemy that you're attacking so we uh, are allowing that. A charge, they can do a charge, begins on their initiative segment, and then they run up twice their speed before the attack occurs. Uh, they can, of course, cast a spell on their turn, uh, do their movement, and uh, it's all kind of fluid. I mean, if there's, you know, they say, I'm going to move up to here, and then I'm going to make my attack, you know, as long as it's not ridiculous, um, we're not being real uh, strict on uh what is being allowed when as long as it's with all within reason and it just has to be within reason and then of course after the sides are are uh, acted and combat's ongoing um like i said we did uh, do some experimenting with re-rolling initiative every time um which really adds a neat fluidity to the whole combat because at one time you're going first next time you're going last and the monsters might go before you, might go after you. So it really is neat. And we're not doing away with that concept completely. It's just that we have uh, maybe lessened our use of it a little bit, just simply for, for the time factor. But it definitely is a neat uh, concept to, uh, to do it that way. And of course, once again, you call your actions and uh, go on with your next attack. Of course, there are several combat actions that can be taken. There's attacking into melee. So if the attacker has multiple adjacent actions, uh, the target is randomly determined is what um, the, the rules say. Uh, like I said, we uh, kind of let the uh, player call pretty much who they're attacking. Monsters, I just kind of ran, roll randomly to see who they're going after. But if they've been kind of going after the same one, then I might just say, okay, that 
you, you two are now locked in combat as long as both of the parties are going after each other. Uh, kind of whatever makes sense. Of course, the range is the same way. If you shoot a arrow into combat, then it could possibly hit anybody. Uh, there is no called targets with the range, with the arrows, with the darts, with the slings. You fire a missile into a group, it could hit anybody. You're, you're, because it's so fluid, there's so much going on that, uh, that there's a chance you're going to hit your ally. Uh, you could charge. If you choose to charge into combat, uh, you get that plus two to hit. Um, if the defender's weapon is longer than the attacker's, the defender gets to attack first. Of course, there's fleeing. You can, you know, if your battle's going badly, you could turn around and run. Um, fleeing characters get an additional attack from adjacent opponents with a plus four. So uh, better would be a fighting retreat. Uh, or kind of a switch positions type thing if you're starting to get bad off and need to fall back. Worst option they could really do is flee, but if you're using some morale, uh, it might happen that, especially with the uh, monsters, that they might flee. So your party may have uh, have some extra attacks on them there. Player may say that they're going to parry, which um, they, can, they don't get to attack. But they get to uh, subtract their two-hit bonus from the opponent's uh, attack roll. So if they have a two-hit bonus, then they get to apply that to, to the um, opponent's two-hit roll. They don't have an attack bonus. And, like, say you're a wizard, a cleric, you may not have a bonus like that. So you may never use parry. Um, if, an, if an opponent happens to be invisible... Um, they can only be attacked if the location is known, and uh, that's a negative four to the to the two hit. So that invisibility you know, helps out that invisible character. If your opponent's prone, uh, you get. Uh, of course, they can't use their shield. They don't get any dexterity, and the those attacks are made a plus four to hit. So there's a much better chance. I mean, they might be out prone. They might be rolling around a little bit. So, I mean, there's still a chance that you can miss, but you have a much greater chance of hitting someone who's laying on the ground when you're stabbing at them with a spear or a sword or something. Uh, concealment applies um, tree limbs, smoke. It doesn't really stop attacks from coming in, fog. But you may not be able to see as well. So there's some armor class adjustments there, whereas cover... Maybe you're hiding behind something, a low wall, arrow slits, you're you're behind a tree. It's not just the branches of a bush, but you're actually about behind the tree and you're partially covered. If you're mostly covered, it can be from, you know, minus 2 AC to up to minus 10 AC because you're behind a nice stone wall. And there's almost no chance of you getting hit by, you know, a stray arrow, for example. There's a slight chance. There's always a slight chance, I suppose. but um, yeah, that's uh, kind of where we're at there. And like I said, with these guys here, um, these guys, so we would have rolled a surprise or de determined that there probably wasn't going to be any surprise, rolled our initiatives, guys would have started moving forward. Maybe the thief wanted to try to sneak around. Uh, another interesting thing, too, of course, is if they had one surprise, um, they could, of course, just turn and, you know, choose to uh, get out of there with that surprise. Or they could rush through uh, with with their surprise. They wouldn't actually have to stop and attack and fight. Um, I said, especially if they had a couple of segments of surprise, they could um, they could uh, rush all the way through there and get down this hallway that this that this one guy's guarding. And maybe the first guy shoves him out of the way. And as long as that attack was successful, because he's surprised, you know, slammed him up against the wall, and everybody just heads on down that hallway. Wouldn't stop them from, you know, eventually responding and giving chase, but you know they get they would be able to get by, and perhaps there's something down there that they that their true goal is, and they don't want to stop here at this uh, at this slight end or this small encounter. They suspect that this is not real treasure, or it's uh, cursed or something. So I mean, it is so lightly guarded. Um, but yeah, that's uh, just kind of a quick little rundown. Of all of the of all of the, so yeah, it's just a kind of a quick rundown of just some of the options in combat, and how we're kind of using it with uh, 
with the Roll20 and how we are using it. It kind of house ruled some of those combat aspects out. And so, yeah, thank you for watching. Bye. <laughs>